it may be work. If I don't push it off. Uh, <laughs> this works. All right, before we let Mitchell start, can you please all implement the FOSDEM compression algorithm? Do you know what the FOSDEM compression algorithm is? If there's an empty seat next to you, move to the middle. That way the people who come in late can still sit on the sides. So I still see a lot of people that have empty seats next to them, close to the middle. Yes, Haram, that's you. There's no seat there. Okay, you're exempted then. No, it's not for your bag. <laughs> oh. Yeah, if you want my attention, you need to sit right in the middle spot there. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to hand over the mic to Mitchell, who for the second year is here present. And as each year, he has some awesome new topics to talk about. Enjoy. All right. Thank you. All right, welcome to the Vault talk. Um, we're going to be talking about secret certs and identity with Vault. Uh, Chris intro introduced me. Um, I've been here all three years now. I don't think I spoke the first year. I don't remember, but I definitely spoke last year. Um, back this year, pretty excited. Um, I'm the founder of a company called HashiCorp. Um, hopefully, some of you know what that is, um, but you probably definitely know at least one of the things we've made. Um, so at HashiCorp, we've built nine tools so far. Uh, I'm not going to go over each of them. I'll, I'll say each of their names in case there's some recognition, but uh, the talk today is going to be about Vault. So uh, in, in order of this graphic, which itself is in no particular order, um, there's Console, Terraform, Vault, Surf, Vagrant, Packer, Nomad, Atlas, and Auto. Um, we've built all these over the past five or so years, um, but today I'm going to be talking about Vault. Uh, so Vault is relatively new. It's one of our newer things. It came out in May last year, so it's still less than a year old. Uh, uh, but within less than a year, at least, uh, this is my first time talking about Vault uh, overseas, but within the United States, at least, Vault has gotten uh, an incredible amount of adoption in some of the most secure environments uh, that I know of to date. Um, and so it's forced us to really mature the product very quickly. Uh, vault releases are audited. Uh, every other release is audited. Um, we've passed those audits uh, clearly if we're releasing it. And so uh, despite its age, it's a very, very widely adopted but uh, young project still. Um, but Vault does suffer from the issue that all the interesting people that use Vault will not publicly say that they use Vault. So um, I'm not allowed to, to say much more except you kind of have to trust me. Um, which in a security setting, there's not a lot of that, so uh, we'll see. So let's talk about Vault. Um, Vault, at a very basic level, is a secret management solution. Um, and so to start off this talk, I'm just going to actually uh, start with the very basics, um, which is talking about what, what is secret, um, what are secrets, and very generally just what is a secret. Um, and there's two sort of categories of secrets. There's their secrets, which I'm going to show you in a second, and then there's sensitive information. And secrets are pretty obvious. Um, secrets are things like credentials, um, certificates, uh, access keys, that sort of thing. They're things that are very obviously secret. They're things that you don't want other people to know. They're secret. Um, then there's sensitive information. Sensitive information is stuff like phone numbers, um, your mother's maiden name, mailing addresses, things like that. Um, and this data isn't necessarily secret, but if a random person were to walk up to you on the street and say, give me your home address, you'd probably say no. But if your sister were to walk up to you on the street and ask you for your home address, you'd probably give it to her. So it's not a secret, as, it's not as secretive as these other things, but it's still sensitive. You still kind of want it to be secret. And, and as, as an industry, I think for the most part, we think correctly about secrets. Um, I don't. I think that most of us actually don't store them correctly, but hopefully this talk will help with that. But we at least think about, about them correctly. I think that for any of these things here, all of us in the room would never push them to a public place knowingly. Uh, we can make mistakes. We could do things incorrectly. That's fine. 
But at least mentally, we're all on the same page of trying to keep these things secret, I, I think. Sensitive data, um, we don't do so good of a job at. Actually, uh, Europe, more than any other region, does the best job at it. But um, still, for the most part, a lot of people don't think the right way about sensitive information. It's still very, very common on a user signup to just take the phone number and insert it into a database. There's no encryption happening. There's no real security happening. A lot of times that database uh, connection isn't even TLS. And there's a bunch of uh, scapegoats that people might say, like, oh, well, the data was sent to our network over TLS, so it got behind our firewall and now it's safe. Or by the time it goes into the database, the disk that the database is writing to is encrypted. Um, and you could say that, but it's still uh, not going to be good enough, as we see all the time of places getting hacked. Um, a lot of them American corporations, but when they get hacked, uh, they get, do a database dump because they're in the in the network. They read from the database because that's not encrypted, even if the disk is. And then you get a dump of everyone's uh, email address and home address and phone number. Uh, and I think that uh, I'm I'm dealing with a lot of these problems in the United States right now, since the companies I use keep getting hacked. Um, but basically, uh, secrets are anything that makes the news. If if the if the data were to go in a mass dump on the news and you would feel bad about it, it's a secret. And you need to store it like you would store any other secret. Whether it's a phone number or your root password to a database, they should be stored with the same level of security that you would just because it should be that easy to. Um, so anything that makes the news is a secret. And this is where Vault comes in. This is what Vault was designed to do. It was meant to store, retrieve, audit, all this stuff securely. And so we're going to go into that. As a brief mention of certificates, and certificates is also in the title of the talk, although I think it's a little bit redundant because a certificate just is a type of secret. It's a more specific kind of secret, but it's a secret nonetheless. Um, what makes a certificate interesting, though, is it's a secret that's backed by a dozen or more RFC standards. It's a very specific kind of secret that's used almost universally for, for some, some identity, some just data encryption, um, things like that. Um, but because it's so standardized and because so much software uses it, you kind of have to think about it separately and manage it separately. Um, it's sort of as if password structures, if they had an RFC standard, you might talk about them differently. But right now, passwords are basically just some type, kind of bits that we handle. Um, certificates are, are by the, at the end of the day, when Vault sees them, they're all bits. Everything's bits that are, inc are, that are encrypted. But um, you, we could think about them at a higher level. So I'll talk about that more as well. So now we know what a secret is. How are secrets being stored um, in a pre-Vault world? Um, so I'm going to call this Secret Management 1.0. What are we doing without Vault? If you don't have Vault, what's, what's kind of common? And the questions that I want answers to when I look at this is, uh, how are applications getting access to secrets? So these are API keys and things like that. How are humans getting access to secrets? So this is you know VPN passwords and things like that. Um, how are the secrets updated when they need to be changed? How are they updated? How do we know they're updated? How do we know that clients got the updated version? Um, how is the secret revoked? If there was a, a breach, how are we making sure that the secret is invalid? And not only that it's invalid, but the holders know that it became invalid so that they'll re-request it. Uh, and then going to sensitive data, the, how is sensitive data uh, encrypted and stored? And how do we know that uh, uh, phone numbers across you know all our applications are being properly encrypted. So unfortunately, um, there's a lot of this out there, um, which is you just throw a secret in a file, and we'll talk about how it got to that file, which is equally important. But still, if there's a file on your system that has an unencrypted secret, then you're already in, in quite a bit of trouble. Um, but but you could be doing a good job of, of file system permissions and things like that. You're not in the worst shape, for sure. Um, but this is still really common. Uh, so then you say, well, where did these secrets come from? And you're like, well, it's safe because they're, they're in something that says it's encrypted. So it's probably safe. Um, and I'm picking on Chef here, so I'm sorry. But uh, encrypted data bags, is, it has the word encrypted in it in the same way that when someone sees the lock on their browser, they think they're safe from everything. Um, but there's a lot of problems sort of with this. So, so config management is a very clear place to put secrets. Um, and it's obvious because config management systems need to have secrets to configure software. Software needs to be configured with access passwords and things like that. 
But why not config management? Why is that such a bad idea? Um, and the issue is that while every major config management system has tried to build a solution for putting secret data, um, getting accessing secret data, um, I would make the claim that that it's you can't just bolt this onto a system. You 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 need something, um, whether it's Vault or not. You need something that dedicates itself to the management of secrets. And the reason is because there's a lot of features that secret management needs that doesn't make a lot of sense in a config management tool anyway. Um, so, in config management in particular, um, there's I guess no might not be fair to access control. There's limited access control. Um, basically, your access control is controlled by whether you have that one key, which is shared by many people. Um, you can't really create an encrypted data bag with four different keys and say that it requires two of those keys to encrypt it. It's really just here's the key to encrypt this one item, and you either have access or you don't by virtue of having the key um, when you have the data. So. That's an issue. Uh, there's no auditing. So if you're using encrypted data bags uh, and you're doing, a, let's say, that MySQL password and it's supposed to go on all your app servers, how do you know it's only going on the app servers? How, can you know if a service that doesn't talk to MySQL requested decryption of that data bag? Um, how do you find that out? Um, there's probably ways to do it with something like Chef using uh, like HTTP logging of something of their API. Um, but it's not built into the system, and auditing really isn't a first-class component. But that's something you need to know, because you need to know if someone who's not supposed to be ac accessing a secret is accessing it, or someone who's supposed to be accessing a secret stopped accessing it, um, and things like this. Uh, there's no revocation. So if you suddenly no longer want that application to use that secret anymore, uh, there's no way to easily revoke just that one machine. You probably have to invalidate all your MySQL credentials. And it's going to become a system to figure out how you roll that all out. So uh, revocation is really important. The, the most important part of revocation is really break glass procedures when you know you've been breached um, and you really need to just really quickly break some glass and, and revocate things all over the place. Uh, config management makes this uh, difficult not, because, not only because they don't support revocation, but also because there's no quick way to really make config management go. It's usually polling based or um, is a slow rollout across your infrastructure. And then finally, there's no key rolling. So there's no way to easily, I mean, you, you just have to build this yourself on top of it, but there's no way to create a version two of the MySQL credentials and slowly roll it out and know when it's safe to get rid of v1. Um, you could build it yourself um, by creating two data bag entries, watching the rollout, watching the active connections to MySQL, and revoking when it's done. You could totally build it yourself, but key rolling is just a foundational concept of security that needs to be present in a tool that manages it. So then the next place that you might put the secret, I've seen the secret put, is a database, um, an online database, an accessible database. And uh, this is not also not the worst idea, um, but it's, it's not perfect. So these are things like um, relational, uh, relational databases, um, even picking on our own tool like console. I see a lot of users putting secrets in console, which was actually one of the big, big motivators of creating Vault, um, Zookeeper, et cetera. And the problem is that none of these things are really designed for secrets. It always kind of goes back to that. Um, similar limited access control. Um, the major issue with these databases, for the most part, is plain text storage. So uh, yes, the connection between you and the data storage system is usually encrypted or can be encrypted. And then maybe by the time it hits the disk, it'll be encrypted on the disk as well. Um, but, but now you have two or three more problems than, than you started with because um, uh, or you could encrypt the data before you put it in the database, you might say. Um, so then the question becomes, what was the key you used to encrypt the data before you sent it to the database? How are you auditing that key? How are you rolling that key? Um, and how are you sure that the algorithms for encryption you're using on the client side are correct before it gets to the database? Because if, you, if you're using weak crypto to begin with, uh, then it's moot anyways. Um, or on the flip side, with the, the database, if the disk is encrypted, there's the same key questions which, we'll, which we asked, which is how do, you, how do you roll the key and how do you audit the key. But um, also, is it being encrypted in memory? If, if someone gets access to the database and they dump it, is it actually there? Uh, and it usually is plain text. So um, very similar issues to config management, um, but uh, yeah. And then the last thing is secret sprawl. So secrets on their nature are sprawling. There's really no way to fix that. Um, you don't want, you want very fine-grained secrets, which, which mean you want a lot of them. You don't want one big secret. So uh, secret on its nature is, are gonna be sprawled, which is fine. 
Um, but then you have to be able to answer these questions for the se for secrets, which is um, who has access to the secrets? When have they accessed them? Um, uh, do they have to reaccess them once in a while? Can I revoke them? Uh, pretty basic things. And also, in the event of a compromise, how do we know which secrets have actually been compromised? If we know that this one machine's been compromised, what can we say about the overall potentially millions, uh, billions of the sensitive data secrets we own? Which part of that do we care about has been compromised? Because at a certain point, you can't, in a compromise, assume all your data has been compromised. Uh, if you're, if there, there are some people using Vault that have petabytes and petabytes of data being secured by Vault, and you can't actually roll petabytes of data um, reasonably in a lifetime. So uh, you, you'd really need to be able to tune and say, that this section of the data has been compromised. We need to re-encrypt all this, notify these people, um, but the rest of it is OK. And then the last thing is how to handle certs. Again, being more specific with certs. Um, a lot of software uses certs. I remember when I started using Puppet, there was a lot of cert stuff that I wasn't getting right. Um, this is before I knew how certs worked. Um, so it, certs could be confusing. Um, and a lot of the, when you Google and try to figure out certs, a lot of it is open SSL command line stuff. Um, but then the question is, how do you, if you create a CA, if you, if you even do that, where do you store the keys? How do you secure those? How do you do revocation of certs, which is built in? And how do you, how do, you do all this stuff? And, and it's hard. So. Um, how do we make that easier so that we could actually use certs properly uh, everywhere? So the state of the world 1.0 is is sort of this, it, it just in review. It just, there's a lot of secrets. That won't go away. Um, you have sort of secrets all over the place, though, that, that you're not tracking in a centralized way. Uh, you have limited visibility into how these secrets are being used um, and, and painful cert management and then poorly defined break glass procedures for when things uh, inevitably do go wrong. So then Secret Management 2.0 um, is obviously going to be Vault and talking about Vault and our approach to this. So the goals of Vault when we designed it was to be a single source for all your secrets. Um, there's a very common saying in security, which is put all your eggs in one basket and then put that basket in Fort Knox. I don't actually know if that makes sense in Europe because Fort Knox is in America, but um, basic, basically Fort Knox is um, in theory where all the uh, American owned gold is stored. Um, and so they, they, it's supposed to be very secure. So the idea is, you know, put all your secrets in one place and secure the crap out of that one thing. Um, because uh, unlike most things with security, it's better to do it really, really well once than to do it marginally okay a bunch of times. Um, so with Vault, though, we also wanted programmatic access and human access. So secrets belong to both machines and people. Um, and what machines need and how they get it and what people need and how they get it is different, but we're putting all our eggs in one basket, so the one system has to be able to handle both. Um, practical security, I get into that a little later. Um, and then modern data center friendly. So what this means is it can't be a necessary hardware device. It should be able to work with hardware devices, but it shouldn't require a hardware device. It should be able to be deployed on commodity hardware. It should be able to be deployed onto a cloud. Um, but it, all, it should also be able to go on to a uh, physical data center and things like that. Um, it should be distributed um, because clouds and the unreliability of clouds sort of require that um, and so on. So that was the design goals of Vault. Um, the features that we got into Vault uh, at, at a very high level is secret storage. That's pretty important. We got that in there. Um, cert management, uh, which came a little bit later. Um, dynamic secrets, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, leasing, renewal, and revocation, very, very important for secrets. Um, it's built into the core of Vault, so everything has leasing, renewal, and revocation. Auditing is a core part of, core part of Vault. Um, ACL is very important as well. And then multiple client auth methods so that machines and humans could access it. Um, going over each of these, there's going to be a lot of bullet points for the next like five minutes. Um, secure secret, secret storage. So data is encrypted in transit and at rest. Um, TLS for in transit, and then at rest, we use 256-bit AES and GCM mode. Um, that's sort of a implementation detail that you, you have to know, though, if you're going to adopt something like this. Uh, TLS 1.2 is forced on everything. You can't use old clients with vaults. It's just not allowed. Um, and you don't need a hardware uh, assistance at all, um, although we do integrate with hardware as well. So reading and writing a secret is going to look really boring. Um, it looks a lot like this. Um, you write to a path with some values. Um, Vault is organized and designed, um, inspired by 
the uh, a file system, uh, the Linux file systems uh, system in particular, which is basically you have mount points, you mount different secret backends, the different points, um, authentication backends, audit backends, they're all mounted like a file system, and to configure them, you write. So it's very uh, uh, Unix-like, sorry, Unix-like in that way, which is everything is reading, writing paths, and that has different behavior. So um, in this case, the secret prefix, the secret mount point is just raw bit storage. So you could just put anything in there and it'll be encrypted. Um, so in this case, we're storing bar equals bacon. And then when you read it back out, uh, you get bar equals bacon. You also get a bunch of other stuff, which I talk about later, um, but it's pretty easy to see what happened here. And we're using the CLI, but Vault, the only way to access Vault is HTTP uh, or TLS over H, uh, HTTP over TLS. But um, uh, the CLI talks that for you for a more human-friendly uh, endeavor. Then there's dynamic secrets. So we just stored a secret statically, but living in this modern world, um, we recognize that a lot of secrets can be materialized on demand. Um, there's no need to, for example, create a database credential um, unless someone is actually using it. And so why not do that? So we have this idea built into the core vault called a dynamic secret, which is secrets that are made when they're requested per client. So the example I'll give you is our Postgres integration. We have uh, MySQL and MSQL and Oracle as well. Um, but if you mount Postgres, like I said, it's a file system. Let's ignore this slide. Um, then you write some connection data um, into Vault. Configure it to know how it could connect as a super user to create users. Um, this data is written to Vault, but it can never be retrieved again. This isn't like raw bit storage. You can never actually read this path back. If you read the path back, you'd get a 403 error. Um, you can't do it. Um, it let's ignore this. But if you, if, if you then read, um, so I want creds for the production database, and you read for it. You can see at the bottom you get a username and a password. And the username and the password to access the database was just generated for you. Um, and you could also see there's leasing information. And I talk about leasing later, but you can see that this is only valid for an hour. So if you don't come back to Vault within an hour, we have the super user creds and we're just going to drop this user and it's going to be gone. We're going to kill your connections and we're going to drop the user. So you have to come back and renew it for us. Um, if you read again, I just switch slides, um, the username and password are different. Um, so you can kind of see. They also switched order because sorting is very hard. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can see that they're actually changing. So you get, um, you get different credentials for each user. So this is also an important part of dynamic secrets. So people using this in production with Vault, if they have 2,000 app servers, each app server is connecting to Postgres with a different credential. And this is really interesting because if you got an unauthorized data dump from, my, from, from SQL and you knew it was this credential, you could actually map it to the exact application where that happened. And you know it had to be that application because if anyone else tried to read this again, it, they would have gotten a different value. So it had to be from the memory space of that one application that this was uh, retrieved, which you know that machine was probably compromised. You could do more research and you could figure out really the impact of, uh, of, your, of your security breach and you could revoke just this one and keep every other app server running, although you probably have a security problem. So dynamic secrets, they're pluggable. There's all different kinds. Um, I won't go over it anymore. This is actually how the CERT CA system works in Vault, but I cover that in a lot more detail later. So then there's leasing, renewal, and revocation. It's what you would expect. Every secret has a lease. You could re renew some of them. Some you're just not allowed to um, up to a point, um, and you could revoke. Um, that's really all there is to it. Uh, I won't go over all the rest here. I don't want to spend too much time on, on all the features here. Uh, then there's auditing. So auditing is very important to Vault. Um, so these are pluggable as well. Vault's very pluggable, um, which is annoying and great at the same time. Um, so with auditing, you could plug different backends it for all requests and response to be logged. So you could send it to syslog, you could send it to a file, you could do both. Um, in production, we recommend you do more than one because this also lets you know something's tampered. If you, if you see something weird in the audit log, you could go look in the secondary audit log. And if it's not there, it means that something is one of your audits are being tampered with. So you have some security there. Um, the interesting part about Vault, which, uh, which I've never seen another security system do, um, not just me, but a lot of our bigger users have said they've never seen it but like a lot, is that 100% of the data of every request and every response goes into the audit log. And that sounds scary at first, like yes, 
the credentials you signed in with go into the audit log, the secrets, all the secrets returned go into the audit log, everything's in the audit log. So it sounds like you're getting some unexpected secondary storage of secrets here. Um, but what we do to actually make this secure is instead of storing the raw values of the credentials, we actually store um, an assaulted HMAC value of everything in there. So your audit logs aren't very human readable. It's a, just a bunch of HMAC values. So basically, the, re the reason we do this is you could go look, you look in your logs and you realize, you're not your audit, your vault audit logs, you're some other logs, and you realize that uh, a user, Bob, has been malicious. So you know Bob has been malicious. So what you do is you ask Vault, what is the HMAC secret value for Bob? It gives you the HMAC, and then now you search Splunk or search Syslog for that weird HMAC hash. And then every audit field that has that, you know was Bob. You can't reverse it, it's a one-way hash, but you know that all these audit things have to do with Bob, and you could basically figure out everything um, he's ever done, everything he's ever accessed, and all the secrets returned. Um, then there's rich ACLs. The H A ACLs look like this. They're path-based, so it's a file system. So we copied um, similar types of permissions as file systems. Um, these are high-level read, write, deny, but you could also do capability level, which is lower-level policies of, of very specifically. You could list, but you can't read. You could write, but you can't read. Things like that. Um, whereas in the higher level, write means you get read access as well. But uh, yep. Uh, then there's flexible auth. So the way humans authenticate and the way machines authenticate is different. So for machines, we have TLS certs, something called app ID, which is like a two-factor thing. Um, and then for humans, we have GitHub and so on. But you could do ACLs based on this. So um, we separate identity, uh, authorization, authentication. But basically what that means is people that come in from GitHub, you could you could do separate policies or say GitHub people only get access to these. So um, you know, a GitHub user has no, no business ever asking for production SQL credentials. It doesn't make sense. So you could protect that off. And, and you could just uh, use policies to control, even though two different totally types of users are accessing it, uh, be able to securely segment your secrets. And then it's, it's highly available. So Vault is a leader elected system. You run a bunch of them in parallel. One is the leader. Um, if one goes down, another one comes back up. You just run it behind a load balancer. It's all HTTP. Um, the, the leader election comes from the store, back-end storage. Uh, we support a bunch, but console, etcd, zookeeper, uh, SQL, a lot more. Um, some of them don't support leader election, but we document that on the website. The, all the ones that I listed up here do support leader election, um, and that's how you get that. And then the last thing about just, just how Vault works, um, uh, the feature-wise, that's also very important to security tool that um, things like config management and databases don't have is this concept of unsealing the vault. So obviously, all data in vault is encrypted. Um, to encrypt something, you use a key. So if you get access to that key, you technically have keys to the kingdom. Um, if you have access to the key, whether the data is encrypted or not doesn't matter. It might as well all be plain text. So we have to protect that key very, very heavily. So to do that, um, vault requires entering the encryption key when you boot it. Um, so when you, even if an attacker were to see that the SQL database contains Vault data, which is all encrypted, and were to start Vault pointing to that data, Vault, it's, it's just as gibberish to Vault as it is to the user because it doesn't have the decryption key. But then you have this other problem, and all of security is this turtles problem, um, but then you have this other problem, which now you have an encryption key, which you now need to store somewhere else. And, and really, a lot of companies we went into with Vault over the past year a lot of them, this is really, really common, put, not Vault key, this is before Vault, put their encryption key on paper, um, you know, not connected to the internet, in a physical vault, like sealed off, where only the executives had access to like the, the combination. Um, there's some really, really big companies that walked me over to their vault and like opened it where there's a piece of paper in it, um, which is scary on its own right, but um, interesting. So Vault, tries to solve this in a different way. Um, if, you, if, you, if you do vault status, uh, well, if you do unseal, you have to enter a key. Um, and then you can see when you start unsealing that you have an unseal progress, a threshold, and the number of shares. So what vault does is uses um, an algorithm, very well known, like we're not, it's not novel for us at all. It's been well known for a long time. An algorithm called uh, Shamir's secret sharing. Um, and it lets you split a key into an arbitrary number of subkeys and then also specify the threshold that you need to reconstruct the key. Um, it's basically clever use of, of math. 
um, in order to reconstruct something from a number of parts. Um, but by doing this, we could split the key for you and, and basically protect you from one malicious operator. Uh, instead, you would need a threshold number of malicious operators. So watching the watchman, basically. Um, the master key is the key to the kingdom. You don't want that to be decrypted. So we use the two-man rule, which was, which was sort of designed for this. But in Vault's case, it's actually uh, an n-man rule um, to split it up. So this is how it looks. You, you have a master key, you have a number of shares, and it combines to uh, the, the full key. So uh, this keeps going, though, and I'm just going to mention, even though I don't have a slide about it, that then the problem is when you initialize the vault, uh, vault for a brief moment in time uh, outputs all the key shares. So you have this other theoretical problem, which is when it outputs all the key shares, the malicious operator could actually screenshot or copy all of them and have access to the threshold. Um, so Vault goes one step further, and each operator as part of the initialization process to get this key could provide their own PGP key, so it, all of it's encrypted on the way out. Um, like I said, it's turtles. So it's going to keep going. Um, but that, I'm just mentioning that to, to sort of let you know that these are the things that we think of, so you don't have to think about them uh, as hard um, in order to get a secure bootstrapping of Vault. So in summary, uh, we, we solved the secret spell problem with very careful access control, auditing, um, revocation, leasing, et cetera. Um, we protect against ex external threats as well as internal threats using things like secret sharing. Um, and then one final note I forgot to mention as a sort of funny thing, um, we still, people still aren't getting rid of their physical vaults. They're, they're usually putting one key share in the physical vault. So um, just in case they lose an operator or something, I don't know. Uh, but that's fine if it makes them feel better. Um, so, okay, so those are the high-level features of Vault. That's, those, that's everything Vault could do without going into any detail of, of how you would use it, except, you know, showing you basics of reading and writing. Um, and I should actually mention at this point that after this talk, I don't expect any of you to be able to just go and operationalize Vault instantly. This isn't really a tutorial sort of talk, um, but at least you'll be sort of on the right path. So now that we saw the features of it, um, let's look at how we use some of it in practice and actually go into a little bit more detail about secrets and certificates in particular. Um, so in practice, sort of like I said, uh, it's all an HTTP API with JSON. So it's really easy to talk to Vault from anything. Um, obviously, there's a Go client that we write because Vault CLI uses it. But um, at this point, there's a, there's a, a library for every major language out there. Um, there's also the CLI, which is good for operators. Um, you can automate it. It has machine output formats for some stuff, which is which we did on purpose for scripting. But uh, realistically, if you're writing an application, you should be trying to use the HTTP API. Um, and then uh, there's integration with the interestingly named console template um, uh, for brownfield software, basically. For software that you're never going to rewrite to talk to Vault directly with HTTP because you're not going to modify the software. But you still want to sort of better secure the secrets. Um, there's console template for that, and I can, I'll go over that. So application integration is the best way to use, to use Vault um, by getting a native client library in your language and requesting the secrets in process. Um, it's the best way to do it because it ensures that the secrets only exist in memory. Um, and so the, 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 the uh, hack that you need to get access to those secrets is pretty intense. You either need to uh, exploit the process from within using like a memory overflow or something, um, or you need to gain root on the machine so you could just do core dumps. Um, either way, it's a pretty high-touch um, attack vector. Um, and if they were to get in, you still have the ability to know which secret that client accessed. So you could, you could control sort of uh, the amount of data that was accessed. The other way to do it, which isn't in memory, but uh, like I said, is good for brownfield stuff, is console template. So what you do is you create a template of where you want the secrets put into the template. So that would be like that JSON file I showed earlier. Um, but instead of the raw username or an environmental variable, you actually just put uh, a template value. Uh, console template talks the vault to long running service that always runs. Um, and it updates the template and restarts the process whenever the secret changes. The benefit here is it handles all the leasing, renewal, revocation, all that stuff for you. So when the lease needs to re be renewed, console template will renew it. When the values change, it'll re render the template, restart the process, um, which is really nice. So if you look at it, here's what a template might look like for um, accessing Postgres data. So it's a template. You're accessing it with Vault. Um, 
you put it in there, and then you it renders it. Um, so this is not as good as native integration because your your configuration is hitting disk. So what we recommend if you do this is to put all your secret files that are being written onto a RAM disk um, and make sure the RAM disk can't be swapped. So that's the best you could kind of do to, to get around this. Um, but but still, it's it's better than a lot of other solutions out there. So let's talk about sensitive information now. So there's secret, raw secret storage. You see how to access it. You see how to work with it. So sensitive information is obviously um, personally identifiable stuff uh, out there. This is stuff that I see a lot of not securing, of uh, a, a, not a lot of encryption, a lot of plain text and databases, um, that sort of thing. Um, so the transit backend, what it does is encrypts data in transit. So Vault doesn't store this data. Um, you give it to Vault. Vault handles the key management it and the encryption algorithms to make sure it's strong crypto. It encrypts it, returns the encrypted value, and then to decrypt it, you got to pass it back through Vault. Um, the big benefit is it avoids secret management in the client application. And the, the reason for this is because uh, developers aren't great security people. So um, they'll probably like MD5 it or something. Well, if you need to encrypt it, that, you're, that's a big problem. But um, they'll probably do something that's wrong. And so instead of putting it on the developer to figure out and keep up to date with how crypto should work, this is now on the operator's side, which is they configured Vault correctly. The developer is just giving it data over TLS and saying, please, please to encrypt, and gets it back, and, and so on. So the web server has no encryption keys. The encryption keys are stored in Vault. Vault actually, there's no way to ever get those encryption keys out of Vault. Um, it'll never allow you to read them. Um, and it requires multiple compromises to get access to it. Uh, we support key rolling and versioning. So uh, uh, an example of this is, is one of our users with the petabytes of data. What they do is every two weeks, they create a new version of the encryption key. And so that when they know that they're, they don't ever roll the old data, but then they know like, oh, we were compromised within this two week period. We could rewrap and re-encrypt all the data in that two week period because you can't do the petabytes of data, but we could do a two week period. So. Um, the transit backend handles this for you, gives the, does the keys and all that stuff. So the way it looks is something like this. You would mount the trans, transit backend. Um, you create a key, a named key. There's no data. We're not writing any data here. The F is a force, but it um, doesn't have to be there. Um, so we're, we're creating a key named foo. It's just a named key. And the purpose of that is just ACLs to give you a path to secure policy on. Um, if you read it, it just gives you some information about it. Like I said, you can't read the key itself, but you could actually see the cipher being used uh, and some other stuff. To encrypt data, uh, you would just, uh, well, this is using CLI, but the HTTP API would just be part of the, the body. But you write it to transit encrypt, and then the, the name of the key, um, the plain text you give it, and then out the other side you get the cipher text. So like I said, as, as a user of this, you still can't decrypt that on your own because you don't have the key. Um, but that's the ciphertext. You can see we have some versioning in there for, so we know what key to use to decrypt it um, and stuff like that. And then to decrypt it, it's very similar. You write to the decrypt key uh, with the ciphertext and out, out you get the plain text. Um, so like I said, developers don't need to understand security to use this. They just need to understand uh, HTTP APIs, which they do pretty well at. Um, there's actually rich libraries for automatically doing this. So there's a library called Vault Rails where in your active uh, record, your, your um, your database models, you just you just say this field should be encrypted. And whenever it's written to, it automatically does the round trip with Vault for you. So you don't even need to do anything. Um, and the big problem, though, is this puts a single performance bottleneck on Vault. If everything needs to round, round trip. But this is the easiest way to do it. You could go to the next level and get uh, data keys. So this is where Vault actually does send you the encryption key, and you do it client side. But it's a little bit harder to use, but at least there's no uh, performance problems there. Uh, the next thing um, is is certificates and, and certificate authorities. So Vault itself um, is a fully RFC compliant um, for every uh, PKI based RFC out there. Um, and Vault stores uh, um, the root CA. It distributes certificates, etc. Um, the people who actually wrote the initial implementation of this um, was Akamai, and Akamai uses it to create all of their internal TLS. So Vault is the internal CA for Akamai, not the external one, obviously. But um, it is how every single service, every single pop, and everything um, 
does mutual TLS around the world. Um, so the idea with, with the CA in Vault is to just make managing certs easy in a secure way and do it uh, without tiers. Like no more S open SSL command line, no more remembering all the flags or, or realistically not remembering and Googling and hoping they're right. Um, so the, the, I'm just going to go into it. Um, so the way it looks is you mount the PKI backend. Um, and you're going to about to see a lot of certificate output, but yeah, it's going to happen. Um, so you write, uh, so you write to Vault um, to create a root certificate, and and sort of you could like um, the transit one. You could have multiple of these. So you could have multiple roots within your organization if you wanted. Um, you give it the common name of the root, a TTL, stuff like that, normal cert stuff. Um, this is all documented online, and you get the certificate out. And and an important part about important part about Vault and the root CA is you can never ever, there's just no way to actually get the private key of the root CA. There's no reason you need it. If Vault's generating all your certs, you don't need it. Vault won't ever give it to you. And because of that, it can never be compromised. There's, it's, there's no way to access it unless someone actually runs a custom Vault binary that you know, you're in a lot of trouble at that point. And, and it's, it's outside of, uh, so that's actually a good point to mention Vault's threat model. If you go on to vaultproject.io, um, we document our threat model. and. Uh, a root takeover of the binary is not in our threat model, so you're you're not going to be okay in that situation. Um, then you write some roles. So roles are a way to configure uh, paths where people could access certain certs. This role configures that <clears throat> if you generate a cert from example.com, it will allow you to generate anything, any subdomain of example.com, um, and there's a max TTL. So you could generate a TTL of one hour, but you can't ever go over 72 hours. So this gives developers a way to request certs, but within parameters. Uh, so here's issuing a cert. If you write to this path, and, and all these paths actually are basically turned into HTTP paths, if you want to imagine the HTTP API. Um, but if you write to this path, um, you specify that I want a blah.example.com cert. You don't specify a TTL, so um, it generates a default of, I think, 72 hours. Um, and then you get the certificate out the other side. And there's too much going down here, but this will also include the intermediary certs for you, um, the root CA cert and everything, so it's immediately valid. Um, and yeah, and, and Vault does handle intermediary certs, uh, intermediary CAs as well. So certificates with Vault, they're just a secret. Like I said, certificates are just a more specific kind of secret. So all the foundational secret management stuff in Vault takes effect here. You could revoke a cert just like anything else, but when you revoke a cert, what it actually does is also enters it into the Krill, um, so that if your software is configured to talk to Vault's Krill, then you'll, it'll actually know a cert is revoked, and then every uh, SSL client has, uh, has configurations for, for Krills. Um, it never exposes your private keys, so that whole attack vector is gone. Um, it can manage intermediate, intermediate CAs as well, really important for large organizations if you're, uh, if you're many thousands of machines, you probably want that. Um, and you could secure it like anything else. So all of those paths are kind of verbose, but the reason there's so many paths like that is because you can make it so that certain people, often certain ways, can configure new certs, but they can't issue them, or can, can create a new CA, um, but only a CA that starts with this org name or something like that. Um, you're able to do really complex ACLs. Uh, and of course, everything is audited, um, like everything else in Vault. Um, so, uh, two minutes over, but that's sort of the conclusion of the talk. Um, I will say that I didn't mention a lot of identity in there, um, and it's mostly because I couldn't fit it in any time that would make sense, um, but also because Vault's getting a lot more identity work that I didn't uh, expect to be happening right now. So um, Secrets and Certs is really the better title of this one, um, but thank you. The URL for Vault's down here, and you could email us if you have any questions. Thanks. <laughs> And I don't know if I have time for Chris. Okay, I have some time. So are there any questions? Uh, the question is, when I said it was audited, so we work with ISEC, which is uh, Matasano with an ISEC. Um, and we have an ongoing relationship with them where every other release, they do an incremental full code base audit. So the, the assumption we make, just because it would be cost prohibitive for us, is that Go itself is secure. Um, ISEC also works with Google and Go to help do some stuff in there. I can't say anything more than that, but um, that's a fair foundation. So uh, yeah, uh, you, you, we can't publish our results because they don't allow us to, uh, but 
we we promised that every release fixed anything they found in their audit report. We passed at that point. If you pay us, which is their rule, if you have a billing relationship with us, we could give you the results. Um, but that's actually their rule. Like we didn't. It's good for us, but we didn't come up with it. Uh, yeah. Oh, do you have support for certificates from Let's Encrypt? That's funny. I just sent an email this morning um, to do to do that stuff. So we don't generate the search from Let's Encrypt yet, um, but that's something that I just started planning out this morning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The question is, if I use Vault with Console, could I use that Console cluster for other things? And yes. So Vault puts all its data in a subpath of Console. So we actually recommend that you put an ACL so nobody else could access this subpath except Vault. Um, it's all garbage anyway in there. It's all ciphertext in there anyway. Um, but if you flip a bit in there, uh, you're going to corrupt something that Vault's going to have to access. So you could use any other path, though, in console. Is there no performance impact? Um, it's just another client that's reading and writing Vault, so the uh, console. So the performance impact would be whatever writes per second Vault is doing, which is basically one for one for how many requests you're doing to Vault. So just keep that in mind. But um, especially with the last release of console that came out um, like a month ago, the we double and a half to the throughput. So um, we're not seeing anybody hit that right now. Yeah, so the question is, um, what if there's a rogue operator that has a keylogger or something on the machine itself to circumvent all this? Um, and if you're running Vault in the right way, that's not possible. Um, the only way that'd be possible is if the operator had root. Um, and a user having root that's unauthorized is not in our threat model. So you will be compromised at that point. Um, for other reasons, though. They could just core dump Vault. That would be the easiest way. <laughs> yeah. I think that's it. OK, so I'll be around. So ask me questions outside. Thank you. Thanks, Mitchell. So we'll go on with the Ignite. Um, while I set up, can all the Ignite speakers please like